Testing, one, two, three, okay. I've got uh, some uh, sound here. Now, I wanna make sure everybody, uh, I'm starting or about 10 or 12, about 12 minutes early. It's about uh, 1048, don't worry about that. It's, it's the be, this is being recorded and you can always uh, go back and, and see it. And, and let me take a minute or two to talk about how I would handle these videos. Um, you know, the, the, work that, the work that's due is due, <clears throat> and you know the date it's due and what, and what is due. So those assignments and quizzes, they're there. My belief is that it might be best for you, for some of you, uh, to have the book open, you know, and follow along, maybe make some notes. If you have the luxury of having, say, a, a phone or a tablet and then a laptop, you can always uh, follow, uh, you can always go in and, and have the files downloaded and, and down, so be logged in and, and download the files and, and uh, try to follow, and, and follow along. But probably your best bet is to uh, you know, is to take the YouTube recording and you know rewind it, rewind it, and, and just treat it like a video. I would say a 10, 15 minutes at a chunk, or what seems to be a natural stopping place, is a good way for you to see these videos and to get the most of them. Now, if you have one computer, okay, then you have a recording that shows you how to do it. So once I post a recording at YouTube, okay, you can always open the Excel file that you're working with you know, and, and work both screens or have the Excel smaller down. And, and so those are some tips that I think it would be useful for you uh, to, uh, to, to try to chunk the learning or the segments down. And, and I try to I try to have some natural segments. Not like right now I'm I've started this uh, about you know I started about 12, 12 minutes early, and I do that because I want to make sure that everybody you know uh, can can have some time. And, and we're going to use some extra time today. And let me see who this is. Join us. Uh, join me. Glad to see you, Suzanne. I what I was. And what I was talking about, and of course, you, you can scroll back and see, was how I would handle viewing these, you know, being here and, and, and watching the video cast is fine. And if you have your, you say you have an Excel file, an Excel, you open that file up, you kind of follow along. Uh, and, and, you know, I always show everybody the key so they can see what's going on. So it, whatever works for you is fine but my suggestion is that you if you want to see the whole thing through fine if not I break it down to chunks of 10 or 15 minutes I don't do that simply because it's just it's it's just a whole lot of <laughs> extra work and so but because you can pause the thing and know where you stop you could view these over a five-day period over or over a week you could you you could view them, uh, say, starting on Monday and go all the way to Thursday, and you could view five, uh, 10, or, or 12 minutes uh, and, and, and see everything. Work, use, use this video in the way that works best for you. Now, I just want to do some housekeeping kinds of things, some logistics. Of course, uh, today, uh, yeah, we're, we're looking at, at, uh, you know, at, at Module 10. And let me scroll back up, pardon me, module nine. I'm so sorry. Today is, of course, the 25th. And on Monday, we looked at Naive Bays, okay? And, and we talked about that, all right? And we talked about uh, a single arbitrary. In both of these cases are due on the 27th. And really, all you have to do is upload the files or open the files. Uh, and you'll be done. Now you also, I think, you don't have any quizzes this week, but I do want you to 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 take the time if you've not, and go back over the the, the Foreman case 
uh, the, the multiple, the mandrel basics, excuse me. And there's a resource about naive bays and types of error. And then these are a series of, uh, of PDFs that I have written out to give you some guidance or to see what they did. And then here, here's some resources about a, one about spam, which is obviously what, is, what we're, what the, what they're trying to do is detect spam and some other resources that will in, give you some deeper information about naive bays and, 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 and how it can be used. So I walk you through the explanation. Then you also have what would be basically my notes for uh, how it's explained it and then how we got the apps token. And remember, really what ha happened there is we just simply took a set of tweets that we knew were about uh, uh, we knew were about the product. We took a set of 150 tweets that were not. We stripped them down. You remember we used some things like uh, we substituted spaces. Um, and we, and we got them, we got them, we got those tweets cleaned up and then we, we, we began to, 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 to use the, to, to determine, uh, the length of the to to tokens. Okay. And we did that. And then finally we did our predictor model. Now this, will walk you through just about everything you would want to know or not know about how it's how how it's done okay talking about pro joint probabilities okay and and how the bayes uses creates uh, using bayes to create an artificial intelligence model okay and the decision rule and a key part of this is that you assume 50 50 odds the tweet is about that versus the tweet is about something else. Okay, and then we use some adaptive smoothing in there. And we connect the products. And then I walk you through all of the Excel functions that we use to clean those data up. Okay. And then uh, we get a count of the spaces. And these are just different text functions, and I explain what those are. And then we then we uh, use the log, the LN, to generate the natural logarithm numbers, the, those numbers as natural logarithms. Okay, and that keeps them from getting too small, and really lets us handle them in a more uh, um, convenient and appropriate fashion okay then some database uh types of functions to do the vlookup the is uh if it's an na true or false then we talk about the test predictions and how that's all done i walk you through those those cells and so it, it's here for you to see of course you have uh you know his book Okay, to take a look at as well. All right, and you have the file itself. So I think I covered Mandrel pretty well, and and and, and of course it's it's there just to upload for the credit. But I do want you to invest some time. Let's see who else joined me here. Uh, ah, glad, glad to see Amanda. You two are management science warriors. But as I said uh, earlier, I started early so you can always scroll back and then talk some about how I would handle uh, these, these recordings. Now, this week, and I'm gonna go back over for a moment, I'm gonna go to the syllabus part. Here's what we have coming due, all right? And um, here we go, October. And October the uh, 27th, okay, uh, we've got, uh, you have, well, we've got the ice cold there. I have, sometimes I have uh, some students that, that have to have a little bit of extra time, so that's what, that's what you're seeing there. But on the Friday, Friday the 27th, you should upload the mandrel, okay, and upload single arbitrary, and I and I gave you the instructions on how to handle it, 
and uh, and that would and that would pretty much be it as far as this week. Now you'll see as we go down into the week, uh, uh, as we go down into the week that ends with Friday, November the third, you've got an exam. You have uh, a case from the the uh, Foreman text. Uh, that is the data, the data smart text, and that's the outliers. And we're going to look at that. It's in the support center file, and how do we identify outliers? Okay, so we've done we it, it, we using the Foreman text. We'll have done a cust, we'll have done cluster analysis to see you know, how what groups or, or segments of customers were there for that that company. Then we use this. We use we we use Bayes to build a predictive model on tweets, what tweets that are about the product versus their, those that are not. And then we look at outliers and we try to determine, this is a personnel situation based on some ratings and some other metrics, it, who are the outliers, okay? Which, lets, which then says, okay, we get a chance to look at dispersion as opposed to clusters, okay? And, and and so that's you know that's that's where we're headed with this. Now, Monday I talked about single arbitrary and I went over it and it's over there in chapter eleven, okay. And the single arbitrary case uh, that was you know I'll just pop the book open and the, they gave us chapter eleven covers waiting line models and we did the single channel waiting line model. Uh, with the Poisson arrivals and arbitrary service times. Now, let me stop for a moment. And if you look at the bottom of page 519, okay, they're saying that this is a particular type of waiting line or queuing problem. You have a single channel, okay. When they say Poisson arrivals, what they mean is that arrivals come in clusters or bunches, okay. And then we have arbitrary service lines, meaning the service the service time is arbitrarily set. Okay, and and then we looked at the operating characteristics, and that's over in the single arbitrary case. Now I ask you, I, I think the assignment I gave you was to was to use goal seek to reach some type of value. Okay, and and, and again, uh, and and just to reiterate, you take a look over on page five twenty one. Okay you're going to see the single arbitrary uh, the uh, how the how the operating characteristics are determined okay now the uh, 118.8 over on page 522 in the text talks about uh, a type of queue where there is no waiting line and then how do we handle that? Uh, and um, again, it gives us those. Basically, it gives us those. Uh, it gives us those models. Now, that's where. And they talk about there in the middle, of page five twenty-two, with blocked customers cleared. What they really mean is we have multiple arrival points. And multiple people to serve. Now, if you take over, and it, let me pop this over here, okay? And it's in one of the appendices, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And the uh, I wanted to show you the model that's there. So let me find here real quickly because they have a nice schematic that explains what's going on. Okay. And you say, okay, arbitrary waiting lines means, okay, if you go over and, and take a look at page 511, okay, and this is a, a, the company Burger Dome, they have a two channel waiting line. Okay. Now, if you look at that figure 11.3, you will see something that you recognize, and that is, is where you go into a place and there's two or more registers open, okay, and there's one line. 
and people, as a register comes open, a person goes into it. So they they're, they're go to the, the channel that's open, okay? That's a different model than what we looked at with single arbitrary, okay? Now, you could also have a two-channel, uh, you could have a, a two-channel waiting line where you have a waiting line for each channel. Now, the truth is, if you look at figure 11.3, Intuitively, one would say, "Okay, I'm going to end up in either one of those uh, of those channels in, ser in, in servers, okay? And so I'll just keep everybody in one line." Often, people uh, often uh, another way to do it is is to have separate lines. And if you've gone to get a driver's license, bought a car to get tags, you will often you'll often see. Uh, multiple lines. Some people go and you know take their driver's license test. They're in, they're over in one section, one line. People getting their you know renewing their driver's license, that type of thing. So I want to make sure that you understood that this model has some flex built into it, and so it's not entirely uh, out of the question that you'd have multiple waiting lines, okay, rather than one waiting line, okay, and and how you enforce that queue now. Again, we, uh, you know, the text talks about what we call queue discipline, and that is if you operate on a first come, first serve basis. Okay, now the there are some ways to mitigate that and, and to deal with it. Okay, to minimize customer weight. Now, I want to go back here for just a moment over to the modules. All right, and I'm going to scroll down. Let's scroll down to to today. All right, or to, uh, this module nine, and when we talk about the service rate, and, and they discuss that over there in page five hundred four. Okay, that that service time, that that service rate. In other words, how many people can be served in a certain period of time can change the, the nature of everything in terms of how many stations you may have, okay? Now, an ATM is, is an example of that, okay? So I, I, want, I, don't, I want to emphasize to you that, that chapter 11 walks you through a number of, of waiting line uh, uh, models or, or, or approaches and as we saw down there, you see in the bottom page of 502, you're going to see a single channel waiting line. And you have a server who takes the order and fills the order, okay? And the customer leaves. That's the simplest of all of them. But if you assume that almost everything gets predicated or driven by arrival times and arrival patterns, okay? And what you'll find, okay, is that we try to build probability arrivals, probability of arrivals, uh, and, and the number of people. And if you take a look at page 504, you're going to see that, and you're going to see how, uh, you know, the, the probability of no one arriving, okay, versus one person, versus two, versus three, and you see how it drops to four, and then at five or more, the probability you know, is, is less than 1%. And basically, that, that does look like a Poisson. It starts high and it ends up going low. And then, then there in the middle, page 504, they introduce the use of the Eigen value, okay, and its use. Uh, to get um, con to, to do the computations at the bottom of page 504, because what we're trying to do is is look at probabilities of arrival, okay, and and that 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 determines everything. Now, where would you get that data? Uh, there's a nice little blurb in there on page 505 about Whole Foods, what they what they do uh, to to handle Q discipline. And, and look at their at their um, operating characteristics. Now, I want to take just a few minutes 
And let's go over to the files. Okay, and let's see who else has joined us. Uh, see, so we've got Suzanne Conley, Amanda, and Alexander. Again, you are management science warriors, my friends. Okay, and let's go to the files. And let's go down, and we're going to get the uh, the the um, the files for the the MIS files. Okay, and here it is, MIS web files. And let's open that. Let's download it. Okay, and open up chapter eleven. Now this now single arbitrary is the only thing that you have to turn in. Okay. And it's called single arbitrary because, as you remember, we have arbitrary service times. The, the, I guess the best example of that, okay, would be, I think the best example of that, of, of arbitrary service times, would be um, going into a car wash, you put your card in, they ask you questions, they know how many cars they need to run through a day. So when you're there inputting your data, you get in their car, you choose the wash and that, they have a time period that, that's arbitrary in terms of response to your actions, okay? You put in the credit card, it takes a certain amount of time that's fixed. Then it offers you the wash. All those things are programmed so it's arbitrary. Now, I want you to open up single, okay? And let's take a look at this for just a moment because it's, you know, again, it's another one of these, and this is just a very simple single channel waiting line model, okay? And you can see we've computed the arrival rates and the service rates, and again, these data, okay? These data are, those are our calculus, those are industry data or data you've collected historically, okay? And you're serving, you know, one person at a time. It's a single rate or one customer. Now, here are the probabilities, okay? And notice what we've got. It's one minus B7 over B8, okay? So we're getting that. That probability, notice what happened, average, the average number of customers, okay? And we base that, okay? That's, uh, that's B7 times two divided by B8 times B8 minus seven. Those computations, okay, the, the, the average time the customer spends and all that business is all there, okay? They're at, at at the bottom of, of, um, of 507. So you'll want to take a look at those and how they've, and how they've devised, devised that in just a single channel waiting line, okay? Again, what we're trying to do is find out or compute how, what's the probability that, that you know, there are known customers, then the average number of customers in the waiting line, so this is where we're, we're trying to figure out arrival time. We have two variables, arrival time and wait, uh, arrival time, okay? And wait time, which is also gonna involve the service time, okay? And so they, they give us that solution. So I wanna talk about that, all right? Now there's another, I wanna say that I wanna show you, and this is where we have no waiting. Okay, and each of these are just are, are covered or described over in the chapter. And in this, we, as, we assume that there is no waiting line. Okay, now I'll en enable those content. Okay, and my Microsoft Excel is going a little bit bluey on this, so I'll close that off for just a second. But we're assuming no waiting. You go right in, you get served, okay? And again, the, the, the whole notion is so, so that you can see 
in terms of how we try to handle these situations. Now, my cell is kind of going bluey on me. So let me do something here real quick. And I'm going to do my task manager. And let me find my Excel file. in that process. And I think we'll be okay there. Now, I'll close that window off. Now, um, you also have multiple, and probably what I should have done is just throwing it there on, on my, uh, just throwing it on my desktop. And then we have multiple, so you can see, now, here when we have finite, arrival times, that's just a whole completely different critter. But I don't want to be pedantic about this and go through all these different variations, but it's important for you to understand that we have some basic types of, of, of problems. And if you, if you go through chapter 11, okay, and you look at every single web file that they have there, and those are the files, you know, that are there, you're going to see the, how those dynamics play out. Now, again, this is, this is important stuff for you, and I think really worth kind of digging into for a very simple reason. In one way or the other, you're going to be dealing with this, these types of problems, okay? And so I, I have no intention to just, you know, walk you through everything, but when you go, if you start at chapter 11, okay, and it would be, it would be a smart move for you to do, it would be to, to go through chapter 11, and anywhere you see the web file, okay, you're going to see a discussion of the problems, okay, and these variations that we get in waiting lines. Now, I also included, uh, a, or I tried to include a resource, and we'll go back up here, okay. Uh, for you, we'll go to the modules that talks about how long will customers wait for service and customer service and customer waiting time linked to customer satisfaction. Okay. And then how long will customers wait for service? And this gives us some good eye. And these are two things to think about. It, 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 it's regardless of whether you're you're running a restaurant, an insurance agency, or whatever, because people ultimately become what we call a product service bundle moment, and that is they come in, and let's say you you know, you, you let's say you go to your to 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 get insurance, and there's a service they're going to provide. You're going to explain some things. They're also going to give you some materials or get you enrolled or whatever they're going to do. So you have, you, you have this bundling that occurs, okay? And so it's important to understand that these models are really, are mimicked sometimes on purpose, sometimes usually not, by the classic kinds of waiting line models that we have and that are covered there in chapter 11. And I really, I just can't, I can't emphasize enough to you. Now, if you look at page 527, you're going to see a waiting line model with a finite populate, a finite calling population. In other words, you have no earthly idea. Okay? Uh, you just know that you have, you try to calculate their channels. Pardon me, you try to calculate arrival rates. And, and this is looking at a where you just have a fixed amount of people who are going to be served. Okay? So that is a whole different type of problem. Chapter 11 does a pretty good job of explaining this, but I do think it, it's worth your time to look at that and then take a look at the glossary. Understand some of these terms, okay, and how these things are organized and the, the, the files there for the chapter 
do a very, very, very good job. Now, I want to just kind of forge ahead here for just a minute because this, this, is, uh, this is stuff that's due. Uh, you have some assignments that are due on the 30th, okay? And we're going we're gonna to upload the outliers. That's the support center Excel file. That's from the form and text. Then Hammond's port one, okay, that's going to be due on the 3rd. Okay, and I'm going to open that up for just a minute. And that's, we're going to work on it. We're going to try to use Goal Seek to, to, to obtain a probability of waiting at a time and to obtain a maximum waiting time by changing this main service time. And then it's shown, and I give you where it's found and where the case is. Okay. Now, I, I started early. Uh, and again, thank you to uh, others who've joined. You can go back, you know, of course, because it's, it's, it's recorded and take a look at it. Um, and I want to take a few, few minutes, a little bit of time uh, to talk about uh, a simulation, okay? And that's over in chapter 12. Now, the... When, when, we, when we use a simulation, okay, we do so for any one of a number of reasons. What's typical is that we really can't, uh, we, we really can't afford to just try something out <laughs> and see if it works. Uh, a good example would be uh, what the, where the airlines have simulators that they put their pilots through. Because you know you don't you just don't put a brand new pilot up in a seven 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 and say here have fun. You, you, it doesn't work like that. They put in thousands of hours of regular flight time, and then they have to go through simulator simulators. And so those are the most complex ones. If you hear you know you read the things in the internet, whatever that the, you know, the, like in Europe that the 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 NATO is 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 doing war games. That's a simulation uh, on a grand scale where you say, okay, uh, X happens, so we respond by doing Y and Z. And, and those war games are all scripted based upon what they think are the, are the, you know, is the most likely scenario. Okay. And they simulate that. Uh, simulation can be a powerful tool if it is, if the closer it gets to reality of, uh, of whatever you're trying to do. And now the nice thing is that we can build mathematical models to do simulations, okay? And they can be of great help to us. But I think chapter 12, uh, chapter 12 here, I'm in, I'm in the regular book, gives us, uh, gives us uh, I think, an excellent, excellent uh, picture at the very bottom, page 541. And what you're going to see is two things, controllable inputs, okay? Then probabilistic inputs, okay? And then the output. The probabilistic inputs, those are, those are randomly generated, okay? You say, what, what do you mean, all right? Let's say I'm an airline. Now, some controllable inputs for me are, how long it takes me to get my uh, airliner cleaned up and fueled up and, 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 and loaded with passengers and ready to go. Every airline knows how quickly they can do that. The probabilistic inputs, the random inputs are weather at, at the place they're at, weather at a place they're headed to, uh, weather in between, because if you're if you know if you're flying uh you know from say from New York to Los Angeles and there's just a huge set of storms this happens a lot in the summer okay not only is it going to make it difficult to if you have if you if you have a layover kind of situation where you're you're trunking people say to St. Louis you're going to sit in St. Louis that's a probabilistic nobody can predict you know what's going to happen 
and so you may be able to fly above all the weather and, and, and go on. You may not be able to. Uh, and so we have these these random or what we call probabilistic inputs that uh, that that we we have we have generated. That's how we built the simulation. Is we say, okay, here here are the unknowns or the factors that could go wrong. Now. You say, oh, well, give me another example. Well, let's talk for a moment about a capital budgeting project, okay? If you look at that, if you say, okay, the problem, the controllable inputs would be, all right, what, why pay people, why pay for salaries and fringe for people, um, you know, what the price, say, of a new machine would be that I'm gonna use, okay? Uh, and you know the the building the the fixed costs okay now it's the variable costs that are random and those are the costs that change according to the level of business activity and they are actually random for a simple reason most of the time well all, if if you don't have people buying your product or service okay it doesn't mean it doesn't matter how many people you have working this the line to to get the stuff put together and boxed up and shipped out it doesn't matter how fast they do it or how well they do it if you don't have any sales sales are are the riskiest piece of this okay because without sales nothing happens in a business and and i've shared with you the, the experiences I had when I was working, you know, doing some consulting on mergers and acquisitions, we always knew, okay, that cash flow, uh, you know, <laughs> from from sales, we were, you know, we were we were doing guesswork, and so those are ran, and, and we could model that, and and we would do so, okay, now. The, the the simulation is the simulation is a very very powerful technique now folks not only uh, the folks that particularly in say the pharmaceutical industry use simulation a lot uh, to see what how drugs might before they even ever do anything with human being they build models to see how chemicals interact and all that stuff if you want to see a simulator, you can go over to the College of Nursing, and they have one of these, uh, like a human being kinds of little. Uh, it's it's not a robot, but it's kind of a, it, it's like a human. It's built like human being, got parts, etc. And the nurses can practice on it, and they work on that ever before they go to the hospital and work on human beings. So we, we can do simulations in a lot of different ways, and. And, and this is important because planning is one thing, simulation is another, because it helps you build some predictive kinds of models for how things are going to play themselves out. And they and, and they're on page five forty three. They walk you through the Porticon project, and they give you some pre preliminary costs. Okay, uh, selling price that's your revenue per unit, the administrative costs. And advertising costs okay and then at the bottom there of page 543 they show you just a very simple what-if analysis and they show us the product the profit equals the direct labor cost per unit minus the cost per unit okay uh, and, and that's time and that's times demand minus a million bucks because they're gonna make a million dollar investment and then that gives them the direct cost of labor per unit, the parts cost per unit, and the first year demand. Okay, and and those are those are variables that you plug in. And so then they show you the profit model with the variables plug in, and they then work walk you through best case, worst case scenarios. All right, and they give you probabilities. It's over on page five forty five of the direct labor cost, what that could be, all right? And 
they're they're going to do the they're going to do the same things in terms of the number of units sold. Okay. Now we're on page five forty six. They walk you through a uniform probability distribution for the parts cost per unit. Okay. And then they show you uh, they show you a simple uh, curve based upon what they think will be first year demand. Okay. Then they show you a flow chart over on page 547 for the simulation, okay? Now, the authors also spend some time talking about generating random numbers, and I want to take a little bit of time to, to talk about that. So I'm going to open this up, okay? And I'm just going to open a, a fresh Excel file. And I'm going to come over here to the formulas, uh, and and the and I'm going to find the rand rand between. Now I'm going to put equal. And you now you're going to see uh, there are two types of random generators in Excel. All right, and one of them is just. one that gives us a, a figure between one, pardon me, between zero and some number less than one. So we're really looking at percentages, okay? And I'm just gonna do this for a second. I'll put, uh, now let's look at the dialog box. Okay, and and we and there it gave us a random number between zero and one, and I can just scroll down there for the number of cases that I want, and it'll give it to me. Now, notice something. Okay, if I come over here and I put in zero, those all change because they're volatile. Now you can go into the settings on Excel. And you can and you can stop the volatility, but you're making a trade-off because you don't get the kind of dynamic that you would want. You say, well, I, I, I just I want to run you know just this first set and take it. I would say okay, right? And what I do is I would copy, and you could do several runs, like run one, okay, and and I would copy those and paste them, just the numbers, okay, I'm going to do here, and then I'll go home, and I'm going to paste the values, so I've got those values, I'm going to paste those values in, now notice it's got that volatility in it, so that's a little bit problematic, so I'm just going to copy these, I'm going to do a paste special, and I don't want to transpose them. I just want the values. Okay? And I might even do a screenshot with this, all right? Or I might duplicate the sheet. But you'll see they're volatile, okay, which, which means they're going to roll through. And I can do a number of iterations to look at percentages and attach them to certain certain uh, certain things. Now, over on page 549, all right, they walk you through operating values for the direct labor cost per unit. But on the page before that is something very very important. This shows you a, a series of 500 computer generated random numbers. Okay. There's 10 rows there. All right. And they've all been randomly generated. Okay. And the authors want you to see that so that you understand, you know, you can, you can generate some of those probable, uh, probable listic numbers just by simply inserting RAN and running through the cases. Okay, and certainly 
Now again, you can turn off that feature, but use the RAN for anything between zero and one because it gives us a it it, meant, it gives us probability, and but it focuses on percentages. Now there's a second product, okay, and that's RAN between, and you've taken in class, you've taken uh, uh, 1123 when I terrorize everybody. Uh, by saying, okay, I'm using the RAN between to choose who will do a presentation. In this, you cannot have anything except whole numbers. So you, you say the bottom is one and the top is 30. And notice it tells you it's vol volatile. All right. And I'm just going to. Now, I want you to notice something that's, that's very important. Okay. You have to be you have to be cautious as you look, especially on the rand between, for uh, for du duplicate duplicate values. Twenty seven is duplicated, if I'm not mistaken. So we've got twenty four. I thought I saw two twenty sevens there. Maybe not though. Well, okay. Here's a twenty four. Uh, we have a second twenty four. Yeah, so we have duplicate numbers of 26. I think we got 17 is duplicated. So you, get, you have to be careful of that, so that you you don't that you don't you don't violate what we call what you don't violate a, the sampling norm that you've created by using the random 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 between. Okay, so again. There at the bottom of page 12, four, they show the random generation of 10 values for the direct labor cost. Now, here's what they do. If, I'm talking about page uh, 12, four. Okay. Uh, well, let's look at let's look at table 12, three at the top. They're using okay random number generators. Okay, um, and they've got the labor cost. Okay, and then the the, then the probability, and you can see, then they show you the intervals, okay, based on that. And so that, that gives you a sense of, of uh, you might one, one might, one might say stanines or um, uh, degrees of freedom, whatever term, it, it, they're, just simply, they're just simply walking you through zero but less than one, 0.1 but less than 0.3, 0.3 but less than 0.7. So you really see those parameters. And then you come down to 12.4 and you, and you see they use random generation of 10 values for the direct labor cost. And then to get the direct labor cost, you just poof, you multiply that times your direct labor costs. Okay. And, and those costs per those costs per unit. So, so, so the process it, it, we randomize variables or inputs into the system, and those are the ones we call probabilistic. Then we have those that are controllable. Now, over in chapter twelve, over on page five fifty one, they show you the uh, the normalizer, okay, that lets you lets you normalize those simulated data, okay. And they'll and that's uh, well. Let's look at it for let's look at it for a minute. Okay. Now I have this set of values here, and okay, and that's the norm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and notice then they're going to ask us. Let's do the dialog box. It'll be a little bit more. What's the probability? Okay, and then a mean and a standard deviation. Now, this could be a set of random numbers, and you're good to go. So, I, I wanted to take just a few minutes to talk about some of this, so you can you can start to see now. If you look over on page five twenty two, you're going to see fifty two. Excuse me you're going to see a simulation results for 10 trials. They have 10 trials, and here's what they thought they'd have on the direct labor cost, the parts cost per unit, 
you have sold and the profits. And they get a total and an average, and uh, and, and that's how they, and then they plug in the, the flow chart to see the profit that they're gonna make. Because their, their, their initial investment's gonna be a million bucks. We'll talk about this in a little bit more, in a little bit more um, direct way on Monday, but I want to close this off for just a second, okay? And let's go over to the files, and we'll also work on the outliers next week. Let's go down to the MIS. There they are, the web files. We'll download them. And I'm going to click on chapter 12, is the Excel files. And they're going to show us the port account, Hammond's port one, Hammond's port two. Those are a couple of cases that you're going to work with. They have the, the port account. Let's open it up for just a minute. And they're going to show us the walking through the selling price, administrative costs, advertising costs, that's a million bucks that we're going to spend, okay? And here's a random number. Now these have been inputted. And then the, 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 the lower and the upper. Now, each what we're doing right here is we're looking at bands of probability, okay? So we've got the lower random number, the upper. Okay. Now, this goes all the way from zero to 1.0. And then we have the smallest value and what we think is the largest value, then the mean, and then the normal distribution, the standard deviation off of a normal distribution, off of a, off of normal distribution numbers. And this is how we come up with the profits. And we get some summary statistics from that. So a simulation is not is not as as big a deal as people want it want to make it in its its simplicity. A simple or a simple model can be a very powerful one. Now, determining what's a probabilistic versus a controllable input that becomes a question uh, that you have to work through just through experience and what your company is and, and you know here's the problem if you miss a key probabilistic input the whole model blows up but this can be a very powerful tool to use if you want to if you want to try to look at some po possible outcomes okay and we'll talk about these in some more detail um and i want to look and see here for a minute because i'm pretty sure if i'm not mistaken that we're going to get to do this with Hammond's port one and two. Now, chapter twelve talks about simulation and okay, and and then risk analysis, okay, and we'll we'll go through this some with some greater detail. They show you the Butler and how they do that. This is and they show us the simulation for uh, this is Hammond's port. The Hammond's port's over on page five sixty four shows you the whole. ATM waiting line sim simulation, and we'll work on Hammond support one and two, okay? And again, we'll see how we, we, we can get a range of potential outcomes based upon what, what, we, what, we were, what we're dealing with in terms of probabilistic inputs. The key is to, is to know those. The controlling cut inputs are, are, are what they are. Well, I started about a quarter, to, I think about a quarter till, okay, maybe, maybe not, yeah, about a quarter till. It's 11.42, so we've put in basically our, our 50 minutes, okay, uh, uh, of class time, and you've got some things to do. I want to make sure you know what's going on here in terms of, of stuff that's due. Again, on Friday the 27th, You've got um, 
the naive bays, that's the mandrel file, and then single arbitrary, that's those are both due. Okay. Then next week we'll look at Hammond's port one and outliers. So this Hammond's port one is out of the regular is out of the uh, the, the, the uh, intros of management science text. The outliers is, that's the customer support. And that one is, if I'm not mistaken, chap, I believe it's chapter four in the data smart book. And we'll just simply go through the whole thing, walk through with him how he got there, how he worked through his solution. Okay. And, you know, and, and, you know, that's, I mean, that that's really, you know, uh, about all that's going on there. The, and it's a, actually, it's chapter nine, okay? And that is the, that we run, that we get into the, uh, we get into the outliers. And you'll want to take a look at that. So you'll want to, for, so for next week, you're going to want to take a look at chapter 12, and take a look at chapter nine in the, in the data smart text so you're on top of what's going on okay and we'll go through those and talk about them and and how we use them well listen i appreciate your time and as i said you know those of you who joined a little bit late you can always once the video's up you can you can double back and take a look at it and see uh you know what what's going on now I also want to remind you, remind you of one thing, and it's this. On the 1st of November, okay, I'm probably going to have a pre-recorded session for you that Wednesday. I, I got to go to the dentist. I guess I got to have some work done, and I'm, my day is probably going to be blown. So this class and the MIS class are, are, are going to get some pre-recorded so you still have the stuff to look at. You can still hear the lesson and all that stuff. But you know, I'm going to be in, in, a, in a dentist chair having loads of fun. So you, know, you say, would you rather pull teeth than be here? Well, you know, I guess I'm going to get to find out, aren't right. I? Folks, thank you again so much for your, for your attendance here. I look forward to seeing your, your work, your uploads. Everything's due on the 27th. And uh, keep up the good work. And I'm going to stop the share and end the meeting. And you have a great weekend.